Greetings to all Restoration 18th century theater lovers and scholars. My name is Lisa Freeman and it is with great pleasure that I'm here today to talk with Roz Ballister and Marcy Frank as part of the R18 Collective Interview with the Author series. The goal of the series is to highlight research in the field of restoration in 18th century theater and performance studies and to provide a venue for scholars to share some thoughts and reflections on their newly published works. Today, I want to welcome two scholars of distinction, Roz Ballister of Oxford University and Marcy Frank of Concordia University in Montreal. Professor Ballister is the author of two earlier monographs, Seductive Forms, Women's Amatory Fiction from 1684 to 1740, and Fabulous Orients, Fictions of the East in England, 1662, to 1785. She's currently the principal investigator for the Digital Edgeworth Network. Professor Frank, as I look to my left on my screen, <laughs> um, is also the author of two previous books, Gender Theater and the Origins of Criticism from Dryden to Manly, and How to Be an Intellectual in the Age of TV, The Lessons of Gore Vidal. Professor Frank is currently the principal invest investigator for Shirk Grant focused on narrative situation. Two very accomplished scholars indeed. Given their shared interests, our idea for today was to put their new books in conversation with one another. From Professor Ballister, Fictions of Presence, Theater and Novel in 18th Century Britain. From Boydell Press, as part of the New British Society for 18th Century Studies series. And from Professor Frank, the novel stage, narrative form from the restoration to Jane Austen from the transit series at Bucknell University Press. Let's get started. Your books share a common interest in the reciprocal creative relationship between novel and stage during the 18th century. But before we start exploring those shared interests, I wanna give you each a chance to summarize what you take to be the main arguments and ideas for your books. Marcy, why don't we start with you and then we'll go to Ross. Okay, thank you, Lisa. And uh, thanks for organizing this. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, I'm really looking forward to the conversation. So the novel stage explores uh, what uh, the 18th century history of the novel would look like from the perspective of the theater. And I take this question up at a kind of conceptual level by thinking out uh, the, the implications of incorporating the intersections of genre and media for literary history. And um, at the practical level, uh, by looking at the ways uh, some plays influence narrative form and vice versa. So I consider novels alongside plays in three genres, tragic comedy, the comedy of manners and melodrama which suggests one way to bring the standard literary history of the novel, bring into the standard uh, literary history of the novel, novels that have not had a major role to play because of the dominance of the realism paradigm, including short novels uh, by Afro Ben and Gothic novels more generally. Um, even though I don't discuss that many Gothic novels, I feel like that's an implication of my work. Um, and uh, I feel that opening the account of narrative form to the influence of the stage brings into view a number of techniques that haven't been noticed before, including perspectival reversals of 180 degrees that are kind of modeled on uh, looking at the stage and then looking at the audience from the stage and narrators direct addresses to characters. So I feel that they're, the book kind of provides a macro argument and kind of a pretty micro argument. Yeah, and I love that macro micro going back and forth throughout the book. It's really fab fabulous. Roz, uh, let, let's give you a moment to to, uh, to to share some of the main ideas and then we'll, we'll get to some comparisons and exchanges. Yeah, thanks. And thanks so much for asking me. I, mean, I think I should probably start by saying that, of course, I think Marcy and I have been kind of writing our books alongside each other and we meet at conferences and we shared our ideas. So they are mutually informed. It'd be interesting to talk about where we depart as well. And that's been really productive, I think, for both of us. Um, I, I, I suppose I would start by saying um, I think I've always been trying to write a book about where the novel comes from. 
Um, so you can see that in my previous books. <laughs> it's sort of oriental fiction, women's writing. And then I sort of thought, actually, I'm going to have to just accept that the theatre is really important in the formation of the novel in the 18th century. I'm going to have to bite the bullet and write Couldn't about. agree more. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so that's and I was particularly interested in thinking about those moments when someone walks on stage with a novel and talks about it. The Rivals is obviously example, Polly Honeycomb, another one. Um, and also those moments in novels when people walk into the theatre and watch a play and get immersed in it. And that's always interesting for me. That's always a kind of first experience. That's a kind of immersive first experience in the novel. You don't get many sort of tired and, um, you know, um, jaded <laughs> um, theatre goers in novels for some reason. <laughs> so, I, and I landed up with a, wanting to talk about what it is to think about being present with something, the idea of presence and presence itself as a kind of fiction um, that is being claimed by the novel and by theatre contemporaneously with each other. Um, I wanted to think about I went to a theorist who I very much admire, Hans Gumbrecht, who has a book in 2004 called The Production of Presence. I liked his idea of presence being something that's made, that is produced rather than pre-exists and then gets represented. Um, and I like the way he conceived of presence as something that is what he calls it, a kind of tension between unconcealment and withdrawal. And I think what I'm trying to do in the book is both saying that presence itself, theatrical and novelistic presence, is this play of unconcealment and withdrawal of persons in the different uh, media in which they appear, but also that there's a kind of unconcealment and withdrawal of the theatre and the novel in those different genres, <laughs> that, that kind of generic play. So the book works its way pretty much through um, persons, fictions of persons. Um, so I have a section on authors who move between the theatre and the novel, Eliza Haywood, Henry Fielding, Charlotte Lennox, uh, Oliver Goldsmith. Uh, um, and then I have a section on characters or roles who move between the theatre and the novel and often sort of move beyond it into celebrity. Um, Lady Townley and Sibber's provoked husband, um, Pamela, who's a, a common reference point for Marcy and myself. Um, Lawrence Stern's Tristram um, and the part of Ranger in a play uh, that, uh, that Garrick played in, in a play called The Suspicious Husband. And then I finish on a section talking about the way that consumers are also produced as fictional presences, both uh, those examples I talked about, people, readers of the novel on stage. Um, um, and I was particularly interested in ideas of criticism and mimicry. Um, and the way that um, critics and mimics are characterised along gendered lines in the 18th century as consumers who they're kind of not negative or monetary examples of what it is not to be present with the work, <laughs> sort of bringing a, a sort of system as a critic to a work and then saying that it fails or being a character like Polly Honeycomb, who, who sort of acts out the behaviour of novelistic heroines in ways that only remind us how far away she is actually from the ideal of Clarissa. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, that, yeah, that will do yeah. as a summary. Uh, so it's, I have to say, you know, it's really, both of these books are really exciting and it's exciting to read them alongside other work in the field. Uh, Emily, you know, Anderson's earlier work, Julia Fawcett's work, which um, is cited, um, I think by both of you, if I'm, I'm remembering my reading correctly. Um, you know, these books that are talking about the aesthetic influences that go back and forth between novel and stage, the kind of formal exchanges. Um, Marcy's genre is always one of my favorite hobby horses, so I was really excited to see you, you know, work through genre there. Um, and, um, but, you know, you're, you're both at your work is, you know, working to bring these formal techniques forward, um, looking at the exchanges between novel and stage. Um, even as they drive, this is, I think, getting to your macro argument, Marcy, that movement from the, the sort of the poetic to the literary. And so I'm wondering if the two of you could maybe talk a little bit back and forth with one another. And this is really the exciting part, of, I hope, of this interview. Um, in the ways in which you see, you're seeing your work is both complementary and in some ways forging distinctive paths of some kind. So, uh, Roz, when we we'll go back forth and we'll give Marcy the last, the last word on this question. <laughs> Oh, um, yeah. So if I was thinking about the differences and the similarities, I, actually, I did originally have a section on genre in the book and I took it out because I couldn't make it fit. So okay. 
<laughs> so, okay. and, I, and I think partly because I got much more interested in person. Um, so I think Marcy is interested in, in what she rightly, I think, diagnoses as a shift from a focus on genre to a focus on media in the 18th century and the importance of drama and the novel as um, uh, ways of arriving at that. And I, I was very struck in the book, um, and I think I, I talk about this as well, about recognizing that whilst theater is about performance, it's also a very powerful print form in the 18th century. People are reading plays. Um, and I know Marcy's seen this as well. When you see plays in print, what you see is a kind of novelization often of them where the, the sort of asides and so forth are actually, um, are actually developed so that you get a sense of affect. Um, so I think there's a lot to say. Marcy has a lot more to tell people about genre and media than I do. I think the other thing that's different about our work is, although in some ways I think we are closer than it looks, is that I tend to talk about a kind of fictional rivalry, which is that the novel and the drama are in some way set as rivals. But I was thinking about that as a kind of fictional construction, because I think it serves both of them very well. Um, it's a bit like the kind of, in popular culture in Britain, the Oasis Blur conflict, you know? <laughs> it helps both. Right, frenemies. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. It helps both to further a, a sort of um, their own market penetration, actually. Um, it's probably more to the advantage of the novel than it is to theatre as a kind of Arabist form. Um, but Marcy, I think, often wants to, um, uh, she can correct me if you like, she sees these two forms as allies and collaborators. And she also wants to sort of argue that actually it's a kind of false separation for the 18th century. And that is certainly true. There are plays that are, you know, Polly Honeycomb is described as a dramatic novel. There's a play called The Disguise from the, uh, sorry, a novel from called The Disguise from the 1770s, which is rendered entirely as though it was a play script. So the word novel is itself just means the contemporary rather than a printed prose fiction. Um, often, not always, but often. Um, I think the biggest difference, though, I suppose, is this one. I tend to work through fictions of person, author, character and consumer and Marcy through genres. I think we're both engaged in what we would see as kind of provocations. So we're interested in the term provoke, but we also want to provoke um, the history of the novel and provoke theatre studies, sort of provoke theatre history to think more about the novel, provoke literary history to think more about the importance of theatre. And I do genuinely think that there's been a kind of, um, there's a problem about um, the way in which the novel has emerged as the sign of the literary in the 18th century. It has certain advantages for those of us who've worked in women's writing. Um, I think that has to do with the economics of culture in the 18th century. So um, we find more women in the novel because it's a cheap form and women are allowed to enter cheap forms. <laughs> um, they, 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 they're actors in the more expensive form of the theatre. So I think there's something really interesting that we might talk more about, about gender and genre uh, yeah. Um, yeah. and media. Right. Yeah. Marcy, you want to pick yeah. up? Well, I want to say, first of all, Lisa, your work too in character theatre has yeah. been important Absolutely. to both of us. Thank so um, I just want to put that out there. Um, I think one of the things that our work shares and this, um, is an interest in what the experience of the literary is. And I mean, Roz, you address that in, you know, explicitly at the level of when you turn to consumers. And, um, but I think that we're both kind of interested in capturing what the experience of reading is, what the experience, how that might be informed by play going. Um, so those are, and that is also a provocation. I mean, it's a provocation to the ways that uh, literature has been studied and the novel has been studied. Uh, so, um, you know, I think that that's uh, something that we could also discuss more. Yeah. So, uh, and I would agree with you on that. I, one of the things I talk about in my book is, is the, uh, um, the distinction between presence effects and meaning effects. And I, I finished the book by saying, actually, I, I think criticism has been over dominated by a, a sense of the job of criticism being to explain meaning rather than to explain aesthetic experience or how that experience gets shaped. Yeah. Um, and you can, I think, see that partly in some histories of plays and theatres as well, where, where very often what you, land, what you see in readings of plays are kind of a spelling out of the analogical 
way in which a play works to speak to its contemporary political crisis, rather than thinking about it as a, a media experience in its own right. It's it's a sort of it has a message that it's communicating, and the critic's job is to explain it. So I wanted, I think we both want to turn more to um, think about um, the presence effects rather than the meaning effects, both in the theatre and the novel. Yeah, I think I think your books, you know, the the intervention you're both making too is to sort of um, point out the ways in which this whole sort of idea of formal realism, which has been such a, you know, <laughs> adamant presence in our field, right, is, is really itself a kind of uh, formal house of cards. Mm -hmm. um, and once you start to probe it, um, I think, Marcy, the way you're probing it, um, it, it starts to come apart. But once you start to look at the way that the that sense of presence can be produced, um, it, it falls apart or it falls away to a certain extent. And it, in some ways, it was almost as if reading back from the late Victorian novel or the mid Victorian novel, I should say, into the 18th century novel without really looking at the sort of strange things that happen <laughs> in the 18th century novel um, as effect of the stage. Um, I want to get to a, another question. Um, that, you know, but one of you, one of the things that you both write about too is the way that the stage is distinguished by its emphasis on embodiment. Um, and of course, that's one of the big things that R18 is uh, interested in emphasizing as well. Um, and, you know, you, you, but you've also, I think Roz, you know, part of your work is, is, is developing this idea in which way, the way that embodiment also can be an abstraction um, uh, the way you put it is like it's presence, it's like the production of presence. Um, so I was wondering if you could both sort of parse um, the ways in which you're using these ideas of embodiment in each of your works. And this time, Marcy, I'm going to throw the question to you and, and then we'll have Roz respond. Yeah. Um, well, for me, really, because um, like the point of departure for my thinking about the theater and the novel was so much informed by the media concept as it's articulated by media theorists and literary critics and media historians, um, I kind of um, wanted to think about uh, the differences between virtual and actual embodiment, not in oppositional terms, but as a kind of a spectrum. And what I think that brings out, so thinking about the theater, what I think that brings out, let me just say, finish my thought there. What I think that brings out is the, um, the ways that identification can occur, not just between people, but between audiences and readers and all those intermediary experiences of reading alone or reading together aloud in a group, identification with objects or with non-humans or with sounds or voices or even styles. So opening out the aesthetic experience to include the whole spectrum of uh, types of embodiment and types of identification, that was something that was important to me. Um, and I, th I think that what theater's um, treatment of embodiment forces theorists and consumers and critics of novels to acknowledge is the incompleteness of aesthetic experience, even though it can give the illusion of completeness. Um, so I, I felt that that intersection had big implications for, you know, how we study novels. Yeah, yeah. Roz, wanna pick up on any of that? Yeah, yes. Um, I was very struck by what Marcy said about the kind of non-human. Um, I, I mean, I did start at a position of sort of saying, I think there's, you could you could characterise a very simple opposition where you sort of said, well, you know, the theatre trades in bodies and the novel trades in, in print type that construct, and the novel claims to give you a sort of being from the inside, consciousness, and the theatre gives you being from the outside and performance. And Lisa, you talk about this really well in your book on, on characters theatre. And I think that is a really, that's a really important insight. But I, as I started to look at it more, I started to realise how often the plays um, are very kind of anxious and self-conscious about the problem of that embodiment and the sort of sense that actually the body might not match up to what it represents. And there's a lot of wonderful comedy in some of the plays that I so much enjoy. Um, I, I was particularly engaged with ideas of ghosts and puppets, you know, <laughs> that when when a, an actor plays a puppet, puts on a squeaky voice and kind of 
and moves in a particular way. That's both sort of showing a kind of virtuosity, but it's also showing that they are a kind of puppet in the in the performance, that their their embodiment is not authentic in some way. And there's a gap there. And so too with ghosts, you know, ghosts, there's a lot of comedy about the fact that actors playing ghosts are kind of impeded by their real bodies that don't allow them to be spectral. Um, so I was really interested in the sort of sense that actually the embodiment in the theatre is quite challenged and that the claim to give you interiority in the novel is also often quite challenged and, and, and comes under question. Um, and obviously sometimes what the, the kind of what novels claim to give you is a kind of theory of mind, which actually takes you often away from character and eccentricity. This is how all minds work, not how this character works in this fiction. So there's a lot to say about um, disturbing th that simple opposition. I think the thing I did want to hold on to in terms of thinking about consumers, I, I was really struck and taken by David Koenig's book, Empty Houses, and what he calls kind of... Um, um, uh, theatre envy in the novel <laughs> and the sort of sense that what novels envy about theatre is the fact that you can gather a lot of people in one place and that they are all present with each other all of those bodies are in that space and actually what that enables is a lot of difference in the room you know whereas if you are imagining that the novel is being read in sort of isolation by either small groups or individuals you have to imagine a kind of shared reception that is not powerfully differentiated so there's a kind of lack of agency that comes with the novel by comparison with the drama that novelists are always trying to reinvent or imitate in the in their spaces which is such a kind of counterintuitive claim right just given the, the extent to which we've always emphasized the novel and the individual the rise of the individual yeah. in the novel um so well just to um uh, well, actually, I should just give you a moment. Is there anything else you want to share before we move on to the, the classic R18 question about, about theater productions? But is there anything else like you want to pick up on that we've touched on that, that seems really important um, to talk about today? Well, I just want to say that I'm so happy that Ross's book is out there in the world alongside mine. And I, I think this is also just, um, it's not a total, neither of us have given a total account of this very complex uh, inter intersection, uh, and it would be impossible for any one person to do it, or any two, or whatever, and I think it just sort of opens up lots of interesting research directions for future work in the field. I think that's a really good point. I'm, I'm wondering whether there will be, it's an interesting institutional point as well, isn't it? Is there, such, is there room for something called theatre novel studies? Uh, that, that has to do with the institutional history of our discipline, it seems to me, where I think we both, Marty and I, are, are kind of, in a way, recognising the problem that theatre history or theatre studies has become a sort of separate field from yeah. novel studies or literary studies, and that, that we need to bring them together, but how are we going to do that? institution well, as, as someone who's like become obsessed with adaptation yeah. <laughs> not theater theater novel yeah. i think there's plenty of room and as, as both as you both said there's a lot of work still to be done a lot of exciting work and i feel like this is a moment in which there's a kind of a critical mass um i'm seeing more and more work where you know you can't just talk about one to the exclusion of the other mm -hmm. um, and i think that that is exciting and i think they they are sort of mutually informative um, as the, 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 the coin of the realm these days, they have different affordances um, from which we can, we can learn. So, um, so I'm gonna flip to our, our R18 question, which is of all the works that, all the theatrical works though, um, I'm gonna privilege the theater in this last question. Of all the theatrical works uh, that you do write about in your, each of your books, if you could see one produced on the stage today, uh, which, which would it be and why? Um, who wants to go first? I'll leave that up to you to decide. Well, I, I would like, um, I mean, I don't know how much I would find it enjoyable, but I find interesting to think about a production of The Provoked Husband, which both Roz and I talk about. Um, for one, Zibber is sort of having a renaissance. For two, um, I think it would be a real challenge to capture what the 18th century loved about the play, but also what might 
just recently, because of the internet, have become a plot that no longer obtains, which is like the joys and pleasures and corruptions of going to the city. You know, like now people can just do it from their from their bedrooms, so wherever they are in the world. So, you know, I think it, it's a kind of a historical um, artifact that could be quite interesting. Right, Roz? A good contender. I have a similar kind of post-COVID, I suppose, contender. I was listening to a program about, you know, what's going back to the theatre going to be like after COVID. And someone said, it's going to be short and there will be no interludes. <laughs> because we've learned to do that online. Um, so I'm going to put forward um, this lovely little short play that I'm enamoured of, but have been for many years, called Half an Hour After Supper. It takes exactly half an hour to perform. It was written in 1789. Um, by a, a, an author who claimed she was a woman, uh, who says she's a woman, who was apparently mentored or supported by George Coleman. And the production was put on at the Haymarket with Polly Honeycomb. And it's a lovely little short play about obsessed, a family of obsessed novel readers and two girls who try and elope following the script of the novel that they're reading. And it all gets thwarted by um, uh, their novel reading aunt Tabitha. Um, and there's, like Polly Honeycomb, it sort of ends with a solution where they're all brought back together, where the, um, the, the naughty girl doesn't get to escape with her partner, but the good virtuous girl gets to marry uh, her virtuous partner, who's also offered, of course, an apprenticeship with her merchant father, Mr. Sturdy. Oh, that's <laughs> half an hour, my God. <laughs> all happens in half an hour. You can see a little script in hand reading on the little website I have called Georgian Theatre and the Novel to see how it plays out. It's very funny. And what I actually really like about it is I think it has a kind of tenderness that um, we often don't expect from 18th century theatre about the sort of loyalties of family, sociability, that the patriarchs in, or absolute fathers in 18th century drama are often quite comic figures who turn out to be quite tender-hearted. And I, I sort of like that about it, you know, instead of those sort of predatory, rakish plays that we associate with the 18th century, here's a different kind of uh, rakish stage, you know, <laughs> which well, has a bit more room for, we for will, women. We will see if we can make it happen. <laughs> This is, this, is, this is what we're aiming for eventually. Once we can get back to the theaters, uh, the R18 Collective wants to do something more than our wonderful Zoom, Zoom productions, um, which have really truly been wonderful. Um, so we will take these uh, recommendations uh, under advice and see what we can do to bring them to the stage. So um, I wanna thank you both. This has been such a wonderful conversation. It's been so good to see both of you. I will look forward to talking to you again and seeing more of your work in future. So have a, have a terrific day. And uh, we're going to uh, say goodbye for now, but uh, I'm sure we'll see each other soon. Thanks. Thanks so much, Lisa.